Enterprise License. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So before I begin today's lecture, I want to comment a bit about what's going on in the news because at last, uh, last time, on Monday, we, we said, or I said, that the Fed was going to cut rates. And uh, in fact, if you looked at the data on Monday and you looked at things like the Fed Fund's future and other financial contracts, the market had priced in the fact that the Fed was going to cut at least 25 basis points and actually a reasonable probability that it was going to cut 50. And of course, they did neither. They actually held rates steady. But they did do something. Who, what did they do? Anybody? No? Yeah. How, lo how large a loan? $85 billion, which even among friends is a lot of money. Now, this is yet again an extraordinary and unprecedented measure. You know, we know that, uh, that the Fed did backstop Bear Stearns, but the Fed didn't spend any direct money on Bear Stearns. They basically got JP Morgan to buy Bear Stearns and negotiated the deal. In this instance, the Fed is lending money to AIG, lending $85 billion, and AIG isn't even a bank. So, what do you think is going on? Does that make sense? What does that tell you about what's going on in markets? The fact that the, everybody thought the Fed was going to cut rates, and they didn't, that shows a certain kind of restraint. In fact, I think it was this class that somebody mentioned, well, rates are already down at 2%. How much more can they cut? I mean, if they cut 50 basis points, that leaves them very little flexibility. And also, if you think that the reason we are in this crisis is because borrowing has been so low for so long that people have been going out and making all these bad loans and they shouldn't be doing that to begin with, cutting rates is not going to really help that situation, but can only encourage it. But nevertheless, there was a crisis. Certainly over the weekend, we had some very bad news. Lehman Brothers went under, and the Fed did what? Nothing. So if the Fed did nothing for Lehman, yet they extended an $85 billion loan for AIG, so, well, something's got to be different, right? I mean, I guess you could see whether or not Ben Bernanke has a brother-in-law working at AIG, but I don't think that's it. Yeah. Well, Barclays, the, the announcement is that Barclays is buying some of the U.S. operations of Lehman Brothers. They are cherry-picking the operations that they want. What Lehman tried to do over the weekend was broker a deal where Barclays would buy all of them and assume all their obligations and allow them to keep on going as a going business concern. Barclays couldn't do that because they couldn't get shareholder approval quickly enough and also ostensibly because the Fed would not backstop any losses that Lehman had hidden in its books. And, you know, in a matter of 48 hours, it's kind of hard to figure out all the buried bodies in an organization as complex and as large as Lehman. But, but Barclays is going ahead and purchasing those units that they like. And there are many units at Lehman Brothers that are extraordinarily profitable, very good businesses with excellent people. So Barclays is going ahead with those. And by the way, there are all sorts of other sharks that are swimming around Lehman, cherry picking various different groups. This is part of the problem with these, this kind of financial distress. We're gonna actually get to this at about lecture 18. And we're gonna talk about financial distress and I'm gonna bring you back to Lehman Brothers and ask you to think about the problems that this company faces. Because think about it, now that it's been announced that Lehman is liquidating, well, let me put it to you this way. Suppose you were working at Lehman Brothers, and suppose that you've been there 15 years, and suppose that you were running one of the most successful uh, proprietary trading groups at Lehman Brothers, and now this news comes up and it's a surprise to you. What is your first reaction? What are you going to do? Yeah. Right. That's certainly one thing. You're going to take a look at what your positions are. And then after you establish that you're okay in terms of your trading positions, what's the next thing you're going to do? What are you going to start thinking about? Yeah. Exactly. You're going to start looking around. So you're going to talk
talk to lots of other people about maybe moving your entire group of 15 people that you've handpicked and developed over the last 15 years. And you're going to start talking to all sorts of other counterparties to move your entire group. And now Barclays decides to buy Lehman, the operations that you're part of. But there's no slavery in the United States, at least not since the 1800s, which means that if you want to walk, you can. So if Lehman buys, if Barclays buys Lehman and buys the group that you're in, and you're one of the most profitable parts of that, you don't have to stay. So in addition to paying for Lehman, Barclays is also gonna have to talk to you and get you to stay, which means that they're gonna have to pay you an extra bonus and all of your people bonuses to stay. So now the price of having to keep Lehman together has just gone up dramatically because you've gotta keep all of the talent and it's very hard to do that. So the fact that Lehman is in trouble has caused all sorts of problems and will create additional amounts of frictions and payments that otherwise wouldn't have had to be. So that's, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind, the costs of financial distress. We're gonna come back to that uh, in about uh, 10 lectures. Okay, so, yeah, question. Uh, I heard a quote with regards to the Fed action that the uh, Fed decided that the problem is not the cost of money, but the supply of money. Yeah. So they're, they're going to use capital as the market. Is that just referring to the, the AIG 85 billion, or is there some other way that they're using capital? No, I mean that, well, that's certainly one way, but the other way is that they are, they are allowing the other banks to borrow from them at a lower rate. So the discount window that typically banks go to borrow from the Fed, uh, they're making more money available in that way. And other central banks are doing the same thing, injecting money into the system in order to calm the fears of individuals. Well, we're going to see that in a minute. We're going to actually, uh, one of the things I want to talk about today is exactly what do we see from market prices. Now, on Monday, I claimed that market prices was telling us there's going to be a Fed cut. Clearly, it was wrong. Now, that's a very good lesson because what, what this is telling us is that market prices have information. But as I told you last time, they're not a crystal ball. They're not perfect. And so they can be wrong. Apparently, and this is now very speculative, Apparently, the Fed decided, as you pointed out, that it's not the it's, it's not the availability of, or the, rather the, the cost of funds is not that's important, but rather the availability. In other words, they're worried about a credit crisis, uh, a crisis of liquidity. And AIG is a very important player in that respect. Apparently, much more so than Lehman, because Fed didn't do anything to try to keep Lehman from going under. But an $85 billion loan uh, was what they decided was appropriate for AIG. The reason for that, the ostensible reason, who knows what the real reasons may be, but the, the reasons that we think this happened is that AIG provides enormous amounts of insurance to a variety of other players in the credit markets. And if they go under, if they decide that they can't make good on those insurance claims, what happens is that those investors that are holding the paper that is backed by subprime assets and that are insured by AIG, once the insurance disappears, they are obligated, a number of them, to sell those pieces of paper. If you're a pension fund, you are obligated to hold only investment grade assets. If it turns out that for any reason those assets become lower than investment grade, and we're going to talk about this at 4 o'clock today at that first seminar, if it falls below investment grade, by law, you are obligated to get rid of those assets. Now, what do you think would happen to the market if everybody all at once decided to get rid of those assets? Right, and, and then there'd be a mass panic. Right. Well, it's not supposed to for any extended period of time, but for any short period of time it certainly can. What it says is if the real rate is negative or the economy is contracting. Well, if you think if you take inflation into account, yes, in real terms, not in nominal terms. You can never have a negative nominal interest rate, right? Uh, unless you know somebody's burning dollar bills. But let me let me hold off on that because I want to actually that brings us back to the end of last lecture. What I want to do today is I want to talk about information specifically contained in interest rates, and we're going to actually take a look at what the short-term interest rate is.
think you'll be kind of surprised to see what the three month T-bill rate is as of today. Anybody know what it is? You seen it? Two percent? No, no, it's lower. We'll, let me, we'll, we'll see in just a minute. Okay, so let me, let me, let me start today's lecture by going back to where we left off uh, last time. Last time we talked about the pricing of pure discount bonds, bonds that uh, that pay only uh, principal at the end and no intermediate coupon payments, and we saw that the price today is simply equal to the face value or principal at the end of the uh, maturity date, and then discounted back using the interest rate. And I pointed out at the end of last lecture that the interest rate can differ depending on the horizon. So a one-year interest rate is not the same as a five-year interest rate because the market has different expectations about how the economy will do and what the appropriate borrowing rate or the time rate of preference uh, might be. So in fact, for every horizon, one year, two year, three year, five years, we have a different interest rate. It doesn't have to be different, but in general, it does tend to be different. How do we find out what these interest rates are? Yeah, exactly, the market. The way to do it is not to think about interest rates at all, but rather to auction off pieces of paper that pay $1,000 in a year, $1,000 in two years, $1,000 in three years, and so on. And we auction off each of these pieces of paper and see what the prices we fetch are for those pieces of paper. Once we have the price, and once we know the face value of $1,000, we can back out the interest rate. We can solve for the interest rate R, okay? So that's how we get the rates. And what I want to do today is to explicate what those rates really mean. I want to show you how to read the entrails and see that these rates contain enormous amounts of information about the future. Not all of that information is good, so sometimes it's misleading and incorrect, but it's always useful in one form or another. Now to do that, I want to develop a little bit of new notation and get you to think yet again differently about the evolution of interest rates over time. I'm going to define what's called the spot rate as the rate of, of interest between today and some other point in time. And I'm going to talk about future spot rates as the interest rates between some future date and then another date even beyond that. So to be explicit, I want to define a new notation called capital R. Uppercase R is meant to convey a one-year spot rate of interest at a particular point in time, T. Okay? So capital R1, that denotes the spot rate of interest between today and next year. Capital R3 denotes the spot rate of interest between years two and three. And capital RT denotes the one year spot rate between dates T minus one and T, okay? So these capital R's are always one year rates. Unlike the little r's, which can denote multi-year rates, depending on the application. Now there's a reason I want to define the, the, these big r's. It turns out that if I have a one-year dis a, a pure discount bond that pays off at year T, then I can use the one-year spot rates to compute today's price, right? The one-year spot rate when you accumulate that, when you multiply them together, that will give you the accumulated interest over this entire T-year period. So if I want to discount face value F and bring it back to year zero, I can just assume that there exists one rate, or I can say, you know what, if there's multiple rates that differ year by year, I can use those individual rates. Okay, so I get that first equation. Now, we don't observe that, so this is a pure fiction in terms of what I'm writing down. It's a, it's a theory. 
So I, I'm not telling you that we know what those big R's are, but I know that they exist. And whatever they are, this is what the price of the bond ought to be today. Any questions about that? Okay. Now what I do observe is the price and F. Those things I get from the marketplace and the contract uh, for these bonds. Therefore, it turns out that as a very simple identity, this expression, this little r, which I'm adding some little more complicated notation to indicate when I begin and when I end in terms of my horizon, I can simply define this little r as being equal to the geometric average of these big r's. It's really just terminology at this point, right? I'm simply saying that in reality, we have one-year interest rates that may change over time. And I know that the price of the bond today is equal to the future course of one-year interest rates uh, as discounts over that uh, period. When I use those as discount rates, I bring back this value F, I get today's price. I can just as well write that chain of one-year interest rates as a single number raised to the teeth power. I can always do that. Right? You can think of this little r as an average, a geometric average of the big r's. Right? So the strict definition is going to be little r is going to be the teeth root of the product and then minus one. That's what the little r is. All right? You take that product and you raise that to the one over teeth power, you take the, the teeth root and then subtract one from that. That's what my little r is. Now why am I going through all of this? It's because I want to show you that from a theoretical perspective, the little r, which we can observe, contains information about the future course of interest rates. Right? Within the little r are all the big r's, at least today's expectations of what those big r's are going to be. So, it turns out that uh, if we look into the little r's, we can actually develop insight about what's going to be happening next year, five years from now, 30 years from now. Now, let me give you an example just to make sure that we understand the mechanism by which these little r's and big r's are determined, okay? So, here's a, a, a set of prices of strips. These are treasury securities issued by the U.S. government and then a, a, a third party buys them and then takes the coupons and creates separate securities and sells those separate securities, each one of which is one of these coupons. So from our perspective, they look like pure discount bonds. There's no intermediate coupon payments for each one of these strips. And the maturity is three months, six months, one year, two years, up to 30 years, okay? And those are the prices. So a three-month strip is currently priced at, at, as of August the 1st, 2001. It was priced at uh, a, a little bit less than a dollar, okay? So how do we figure out what the little r is associated with those various prices? Well, let's take an example. The, um, uh, the five-year strip is priced at about 80 cents to the dollar, okay? So the price is 0.797, and that's equal to a dollar paid five years later. So therefore, it's a dollar discounted back five years. So I'm gonna use my little r, and the 0, 0,5 indicates that it's today's spot rate for borrowing over a five-year horizon. And it turns out that when I solve for that, I get a number that's 4.64%. That's the, the rate of return, the cost of capital, the yield uh, of that five-period horizon. Okay? Any questions about this? Yeah. So if it's less than a year's horizon, then you basically have to go the other way in terms of the power, right? Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah, that's it. It's just a shorter Support time the PBS horizon is than a year. Now, 
suppose that we observe a bunch of these, as we do with the strips. So in other words, you, you've got a five-year rate, you've got a 10-year rate, you've got a two-year rate, and so on. What does that tell us about the future? Well, let's write down the big R's. Even though we don't see them, we know that somehow, implicitly, they're there. So what are the relationships between the little R's and the big R's? Well, you'll see something really neat emerge out of this. So we'll start with a one-year strip. With a one-year strip, the little r and the big r is the same, right? Because it's only one year. So there's a one-year big r, a one-year little r, and when you work out the math, they're actually equal to each other. But now, when you go with two years, three years, and t years, it gets a little bit more complicated. Take a look at what happens if you take the price of the one year and you divide that into the price of the two year. So these two securities, the one year and the two year, they have the same F, the same face value. They pay $1,000 at maturity. But one of them goes for one year and one of them goes for two years. What happens when you take P01 and you divide that by P02? By the way, both of those prices exist today, right? For example, if you take a look at the strips, the price of P01 is 0 0.967, the price of P02 is 0.927. If I take the price of one divided by the price of two, what do I get? Yeah. Exactly. I get one plus R2. And so if I subtract one from that, I get R2. So let's just go back. I don't have a calculator with me, but I'm sure all of you do. Somebody do that division for me, will you? Can you take 0.967 and divide that by 0.927? What do you get? 0.967 divided by 0.927. What's that? 1.04, and then subtract one from that, 4%. Actually, can you give me a few more digits of accuracy? What's that? 4.314. So, it turns out that in year, in year zero, where we have all of these prices, we actually have a forecast for what big R2 is. Big R2, in this case, is the borrowing cost between year one and year two. But we're sitting at year zero. So implicit in the price of a two-year bond and a one-year bond, implicit in that is a forecast of what the price is going to be, or what the yield is going to be, or what the borrowing cost is going to be between years one and two. In this case, 4.3%. So. And that's a really uh, important observation. If you plot these little r's on a graph as a function of time, you actually get a sense of where the future big r's are going to lie. This plot, a plot of the r's as a function of time, is known as the term structure of interest rates or the yield curve. And it gives you a sense of where future interest rates are going to go. If the curve is upward sloping, it says that as you go out into longer maturities, your average yield, the average, the geometric average of all the big R's, it's getting bigger as time grows, as the time horizon grows. If it's downward sloping, it suggests that future interest rates, future big R's are declining. So I want to show you what this yield curve looks like today. Now, it turns out that we don't have a yield curve of strips as readily available as a yield curve that includes coupon payments. So I'm going to come back to the distinction a little bit later on. We haven't talked about coupon bonds yet, but I just want to show you what the yield curve is. I, I, I'm on the Bloomberg website. This is uh, publicly available, so I don't have a particular license for it. It's the, the public version. And if you click on market data and then click on rates and bonds, you're going to get this page right here. So these are the different U.S. Treasury securities, the different horizons. 
these are the coupons for less than a year there are no coupon payments so these are pure discount bonds and there's the graph that's it that graph the green line is showing you the future course of interest rates it's extremely low today the scale is on the left-hand axis and by the way these are in percent so where we are today for a three-month rate it's close to zero it's actually three basis points three basis points for a three-month T-bill what is that telling you what's the relationship between price and this little r yeah well that that's right but how does that yield get so low yes the price is extremely high that's right price is equal to the three month payout divided by one plus little r if little r ends up being really really tiny it's only because the price is really high. Why would the price be high? Because US Treasuries are the only safe thing to own right now. At least that's what many people think, exactly. There is a, a, a really strong flight to liquidity going on in markets as of today. And how do you know that it's as of today? Well, take a look at the difference between the green line and the orange line. The orange line was what it was yesterday. You see, that there's a difference. There's a noticeable difference on the short end. That means a lot of people are out there buying treasury bills now, probably as we speak. Uh, maybe you ought to go and uh, buy some treasury bills. People are scared. And they're scared because of all the things that are going on in the news. And this is exactly what the Fed is trying to, to stave off. So you're absolutely right. The Fed is not worried about the cost of borrowing. They're worried about whether or not there's money out there to be able to calm the fears of market participants. Yeah. That's right, they might have to. So that expectation actually is built into these prices. The market recognizes that and they're worried. But think about that. If the Fed has said that they're going to be cutting rates, possibly cutting rates in the future, and yet the rate stays high in going forward, relatively high, and rates go down today, what that's telling you is that the market is being driven by a panic reaction. Now, now rates are going to go up. So the fact that you see the market uh, determining a yield curve that's upward sloping, that's telling you that people expect that rates are going to go up, that rates have to go up, for one of two reasons. And in fact, you can take a look at the steepness of the yield curve as telling you what the market's expectations are for how quickly rates are going to go up and, and where they're going to go up. So you have to look at the, the uh, x-axis a little bit differently. These are denominated in years, so this is three months, six months, one year, two, three, four, five, up to 10, then 15, 20, and 30. So these are long-term long rates. And you can see that the yield curve really goes up sharply after the first three months. There's a big increase in the slope, and then it becomes a little bit more gradual. That's an ex uh, a, uh, a sign of a short-term flight to quality or flight to liquidity, but that the market expects over time as things calm down that interest rates will go up for one of two reasons. You know, either there are inflationary pressures and that will drive rates up, or there's going to be some economic consequences of what's happening today and that will ultimately cause rates to go up. Yeah. Because 
that's sort of it, it depends. Cost the arranging building. That's right. It, it depends on the nature of the crisis. So in certain countries where there is a financial crisis, the typical reaction of monetary authorities is to flood the market with cash because that's their reaction to a liquidity crunch. They want to reduce the prospect of having a kind of run on the banks. So they'll flood the market with, uh, with their currency. When you do that, you encourage inflation, and that's why interest rates go up in those kind of economies. The U.S., for better or for worse, has shown a certain degree of monetary restraint over the years in that while they do certainly cut interest rates, and Alan Greenspan was uh, uh, very active in, in this respect over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, the fact is that there has been more measured control of monetary policy in the United States. So what that means is that this is a symptom more of a short-term cash crunch. People are just putting money in treasury bills for the short term without any expectation that the Fed is going to dramatically increase the money, money supply. If they did that, we would then see interest rates rise because inflation would be much more of a problem. Okay, uh, yes. While that might stave off certain credit crunches, that would actually encourage inflation. Inflation causes, so I, 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 I see the confusion, and let me make a distinction. There are two different interest rates that are going on. There's the market rate of interest, which is what this is. And then there's the Fed's stated federal funds rate, which is what it charges its other banks, member banks, for borrowing. The Fed is able to control what it charges to other banks. The Fed cannot control these rates. So the interest rates that you're, you're thinking about, that, for example, when the raises rates, they do so uh, so as to discourage lots of uh, borrowing and lending and reduce the amount of money that's in the money so, uh, that's in, uh, in circulation, and that decreases uh, business activity, which then reduces the pressure on inflation. Okay. So that's what they do in response, but they don't control the interest rate determined by the market for treasury bills. And in these interest rates, these 30-year rates, as opposed to the overnight borrowing rates and Fed funds rates, these rates give you a sense of what the market is expecting over time.
powers granted to them uh, as part of the various uh, legal um, uh, legal proposals that were developed to create the Federal Reserve System. Um, where does the Fed get its money from? It gets, it gets its money from the Treasury. So the Fed can actually engage in what are called open market operations and uh, can actually contract or expand money supply based upon what the Treasury will, uh, will allow it to do or will work with it to do. So, the, and the Fed controls the borrowing rate among all of the member banks. And actually, all of the major banks are members. So it's not like you can start up your bank tomorrow. In order to start a bank and deal with the public, you need a bank charter. And the bank charter is issued by the government. And once you're part of that network, you are part of the, uh, the Federal Reserve System. Yes, they, in essence, losing also themselves. Well, they're they're not trying to make money. That's not their objective. Uh, and if they're losing money, ultimately, it's not them that is losing money. It is who? Yeah, we're we're, we're losing money. It's, it's government sponsored. So that's one of the reasons why I think the Fed has been so concerned about uh, bailing out Lehman Brothers and even the bailout of Bear Stearns, which did not necessarily cost them anything. Uh, the fact that they were willing to provide this backstop guarantee in order to make the deal happen, that implicit insurance is a cost that we ultimately end up paying. They got a huge amount of heat for that, and that's one of the reasons why they decided to back off from the Lehman Brothers deal. It's because they would have gotten huge, huge backlash uh, from that kind of an event. Now, AIG, the fact that they went and did something there tells you something about how important AIG is or what repercussions might have come about if they had let AIG fail. So that says more not about the Fed, but more about the situation with AIG and the specific financial transactions that they were engaged in. Okay, let me uh, continue on, and uh, sorry, I'm going to uh, hold off questions for a little bit longer, but I do want to cover uh, you know, some additional material. So this is the expression that we just described for getting a sense of future interest rates. And we saw, given today's uh, yield curve, you know, that there is some sense that interest rates are going to rise. But it turns out that the yield curve contains all sorts of information, not just about one-year rates, but in fact about multi-year rates. So this is a clear example. This is one example. Um, and it turns out that there's another example that makes this a little bit clearer, which is future rates and forward rates. These are all very confusing terminology unless you sit down and read through it carefully. So I would encourage you all to do that after this lecture. There's a lot of notation in this lecture, not a lot of conceptual challenges, because all the conceptual challenges we derived when we talked about net present value rules. So most of this is just lots of notation and terminology. So let me describe the terminology here. At date zero, if we focus on the price of a bond that matures at time t minus one, and at date zero, if we focus on the price of a bond that matures at day t, and we take the ratio of those two, then it turns out we're getting an implicit forecast of the future one year spot rate between t minus one and t, right? That's just what we did with R2. So this is true in general, and there's a name for this forecast. It's called today's forward rate between dates t minus one and t. It is a forecast of the future spot rate between dates t minus one and t, okay? We don't know what that spot rate is going to be in general. We don't know what future interest rates are going to be. It's uncertain. But today, implicit in today's prices, is a forecast of that unknown future, and we're going to call that forecast the forward rate. So that is really meant to convey that it is a rate that we observe today, and it is meant to capture the market's best guess about what the future spot rate will be. Okay? So this is, I know, a little bit confusing, and just to give you a summary of all the notation and terminology we've defined today, we have a spot rate, right? That's a spot rate is the rate that you have to pay or that you will earn on the spot for a period of time. So you've got the two-year spot rate today. You've also got 
future spot rates, which you don't know and don't observe. You also have a forward rate, which you do observe today, and the forward rate is a rate that applies over some period in the future, and it's today's best guess of what that future rate will be. Now, we can see the implicit forecasts that are, are in these yield curves. The one-year spot rate today also happens to be equal to the one-year forward rate. However, if you take a look at the two-year spot rate and compare that with the one-year spot rate, you can compute the, the, the one-year forward rate for borrowing between years one and two. And similarly, if you compare the four-year spot rate with the three-year spot rate, you will be able to figure out what the forward rate is for borrowing one year between three and four, okay? Now, you might think this is complicated. Believe me, it gets even more complicated when you think about multi-year forward rates. So suppose I asked you, what is the two-year borrowing rate three years from now? Then what you would do is to take a five-year bond and compare that to a three-year bond, and that would give you the two-year forward rate today, starting in year three. Okay? Lots of different rates. This is, again, why I told you every time you have a problem like this, draw a timeline. Otherwise, you're going to get hopelessly confused. Now, um, in general, you can define forward interest rates between any two points in time, between time T1 and T2. And so, the typical forward transaction is one where today, we agree to do a deal that starts at some point T1 in the future and concludes at some point T2 in the future. And that's known as a forward transaction. The transaction that we agree upon today to engage in sometime in the future. Now, I want to work through an example because this is a bit confusing. So, let me show you how this might work and why the whole idea of forward rates and future spot rates is so important. A practical example is that you are the chief financial officer of a multinational company based in the U.S. And you're going to get $10 million a year from now from operations overseas. And it's going to come back in the form of dollars. So it's not going to come back today. It's going to come back exactly one year from today. Now, you've got to pay dividends two years from today. So you're going to use that money that's going to come in a year from now, and then at the end of year two, you're going to pay it out. And so you don't want to take that money next year and fool around with it. You don't, you don't know what interest rate you're going to be, but what you'd like to be able to do is to today lock in a rate of return between years one and two. Because you know that you're going to need to get that money invested in year one, and you'd like to be able to pay it out in year two. And you want to do that all today. So how do you do that? Well, you go to the financial markets and you look at the real curve and you see what the one-year rate is and what the two-year rate is. And what you get from looking at the newspaper is the one-year rate is 5% and the two-year rate is 7%. Question, is 7% a spot rate, forward rate, or future spot rate? It's a spot rate of what? Exactly. It, it is today's spot rate between now and two years. Right? Two year spot rate. Right? What you care about, though, for the example that I just gave you, is what? Exactly. You care about the one year spot rate in one year, the future one year spot rate, which you don't know what it's going to be. That's uncertain. But you do have the what rate? What rate do you have today? The forward rate. Right. You have the forward rate because you've got the two year spot rate, you've got the one year spot rate. So when you compare the two, implicitly in that, in those two rates is the future, is the forecast of the future one year spot rate or today's forward rate between years one and two. Alright. Now let's get to brass tacks. How do you go about locking in the rate between years one and two? Well, here's a, a really cool transaction that you can do. Uh, today, borrow 
$1.524 million for a year. How do you know you can do that? Exactly. You've got the one-year interest rate at 5%, so if that's really a market rate, that means that you should be able to borrow at that rate. Okay? So when you're borrowing money, what are you doing? You're, are you buying a bond? You're selling the bond. You're issuing a bond. Right. Okay. So you borrowed $9.52 million today. Now, in a minute, I'll explain to you why that, that num number is so weird. Then, after you get the money today, I'm going to ask you to put it into the two-year bond. So you got $9.52 million in cash and you put it into a two-year bond. So let's take a look at what you've done with that transaction. The outcome looks like this. In year zero, you've borrowed 9.52 and then you've taken the proceeds and you've bought a bond at 9.52. So in fact, your net expenditures is nothing, right? You borrowed money, you take that money, and you bought something else, you've loaned it out. You borrowed money for one year, you've loaned it out for two years. That's what you've done. So today, you actually have zero in terms of your, your assets and liabilities. Okay, now let's see what happens next year. In one year's time, that 9.52 magically turns into 10. Okay? So, but it's a negative 10, meaning you borrowed 9.52 you got to pay back 9.52 with interest. How much interest? 5%. That's the one-year rate. So now you actually have to pay back $10 million. Well, it just so happens you have $10 million. How? From money that's coming in from your subsidiary, that repatriation of that money. So you take that $10 million, you pay it back, and you're done with that part of your portfolio. So what do you have left? What you have left is a bond that will pay you money in the year after that, between years one and two. And there you go, you get paid $10.9 million. You've done all of this transaction today. You've locked in the rates today. Okay? Yeah. That's right. You're locking, well, you're locking in the forward rate, which is the forecast Right, it's, it's, it's what the market expects the future one year spot rate will be. Now, that's a, good, that's a good point that you bring up, which is, let's say, let's say that in year one, it turns out that at that point in time, the one year spot rate is 7%. Are you happy or are you sad? Some people say sad, some people say happy. <coughs> What, what do you, if the one year spot rate, one year from now, is 7%, and you've done this deal already, you're happy, that's right. Because, what are you getting on your portfolio? 9%. Now, wait a minute, how did you get 9%? I thought that I told you the two year rate was 7%. I'm, I'm purposely confusing you, so I'm hoping it works. And then I'm going to try to unconfuse you, and I hope that works too. 5% is the one year spot rate, 7% is the two year spot rate. Yeah. Right, that's right. The year between, the rate between years one and two is around 9%. And the reason it's got to be that way is the 7% that I told you. That's a two-year rate, right? That's the average of two years. But you know what the rate is the first year? The first year rate is 5%. So if something averages to 7% over two years, but the first year is five, the second year's gotta be greater than seven, otherwise the average can't be seven. In fact, the second year rate, the, the one year rate between years one and two is around 9%. And so that's why if 
when you arrive on, at the end of year one, ready to borrow for one more year, and you've already locked in a 9% rate, you are pretty happy that the rate at that time is seven. However, if I told you that the rate at that time was 15, you'd be kicking yourself because you locked in a 9% rate and yet it's 15%, okay? So there's room for regret as well as celebration depending on what market's gonna do. But the point is that in year zero, I don't know what it's gonna be and I'm not, a, I'm not a hedge fund manager, I'm not a trader, I don't care, I don't wanna make a bet on future interest rates, I just wanna get this problem solved. And right now, today, I can actually solve my problem of, of figuring out how to invest my money between years one and two. The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer a lot of notation in this lecture, not a lot of conceptual challenges, because all the conceptual challenges we derived when we talked about net present value rules. So most of this is just lots of notation and terminology. So let me describe the terminology here. At date zero, if we focus on the price of a bond that matures at time t minus one, and at date zero, if we focus on the price of a bond that matures at day t, and we take the ratio of those two, then it turns out we're getting an implicit forecast of the future one year spot rate between t minus one and t, right? That's just what we did with R2. So this is true in general, and there's a name for this forecast. It's called today's forward rate between dates T minus one and T. It is a forecast of the future spot rate between dates T minus one and T, okay? We don't know what that spot rate is going to be in general. We don't know what future interest rates are going to be. It's uncertain. But today, implicit in today's prices, is a forecast of that unknown future. And we're gonna call that forecast the forward rate. So that is really meant to convey that it is a rate that we observe today, and it is meant to capture the market's best guess about what the future spot rate will be, okay? So this is, I know, a little bit confusing, and just to give you a summary of all the notation and terminology we've defined today, we have a spot rate, right? That's, a spot rate is the rate 
that you have to pay or that you will earn on the spot for a period of time. So you've got the two-year spot rate today. You've also got future spot rates, which you don't know and don't observe. You also have a forward rate, which you do observe today, and the forward rate is a rate that applies over some period in the future, and it's today's best guess of what that future rate will be. Now, we can see the implicit forecasts that are, are in the yield curve. The one-year spot rate today also happens to be equal to the one-year forward rate. However, if you take a look at the two-year spot rate and compare that with the one-year spot rate, you can compute the, the, the one-year forward rate for borrowing between years one and two. And similarly, if you compare the four-year spot rate with the three-year spot rate, you will be able to figure out what the forward rate is for borrowing one year between three and four. Okay? Now, you might think this is complicated. Believe me, it gets even more complicated when you think about multi-year forward rates. So suppose I asked you, what is the two-year borrowing rate three years from now? Then what you would do is to take a five-year bond and compare that to a three-year bond, and that would give you the two-year forward rate today, starting in year three. Okay? Lots of different rates. This is, again, why I told you every time you have a problem like this, draw a timeline. Otherwise, you're going to get hopelessly confused. Now, um, in general, you can define forward interest rates between any two points in time, between time T1 and T2. And so the typical forward transaction is one where today we agree to do a deal that starts at some point T1 in the future and concludes at some point T2 in the future. And that's known as a forward transaction. It's a transaction that we agree upon today to engage in sometime in the future. Okay. Now, I want to work through an example because this is a bit confusing. So let me show you how this might work and why the whole idea of forward rates and future spot rates is so important. A practical example is that you are the chief financial officer of a multinational company based in the US. And you're going to get $10 million a year from now from operations overseas. And it's going to come back in the form of dollars. But it's not going to come back today. It's going to come back exactly one year from today. Now, you've got to pay dividends two years from today. So you're going to use that money that's going to come in a year from now. And then at the end of year two, you're going to pay it out. And so you don't want to take that money next year and fool around with it. You don't, you don't know what interest rates are going to be. But what you'd like to be able to do is to today lock in a rate of return between years one and two. Because you know that you're going to need to get that money invested in year one. And you'd like to be able to pay it out in year two. And you want to do that all today. So how do you do that? Well, you go to the financial markets and you look at the yield curve. And you see what the one-year rate is and what the two-year rate is. And what you get from looking at the newspaper is the one-year rate is 5% and the two-year rate is 7%. Question, is 7% a spot rate, forward rate, or future spot rate? It's a spot rate of what? Exactly. It, it is today's spot rate between now and two years from now. It's a two-year spot rate. Right. What you care about, though, for the example that I just gave you, is what? One year spot rate in one year. Exactly. You care about the one year spot rate in one year, the future one year spot rate, which you don't know what it's going to be. That's uncertain. But you do have the what rate? What rate do you have today? The forward rate, right. You have the forward rate because you've got the two year spot rate, you've got the one year spot rate. So when you compare the two, implicitly in that, in those two rates, is the future, is the forecast of the future one year spot rate or today's forward rate between years one and two. 
All right. Now, let's get the brass tacks. How do you go about locking in the rate between years one and two? Well, here's a, a really cool transaction that you can do. Uh, today, borrow $9.524 million for a year. How do you know you can do that? Exactly. You've got the one year interest rate at 5%, so if that's really a market rate, that means that you should be able to borrow at that rate. Okay? So when you're borrowing money, what are you doing? You're, are you buying a bond? You're selling a bond. You're issuing a bond. Right. Okay, so you borrowed $9.52 million today. Now, in a minute, I'll explain to you why that, that num number is so weird. Then, after you get the money today, I'm going to ask you to put it into the two-year bond. So, you've got $9.52 million in cash and you put it into a two-year bond. So let's take a look at what you've done with that transaction. The outcome looks like this. In year zero, you borrowed 9.52, and then you've taken the proceeds and you bought a bond at 9.52. So in fact, your net expenditures is nothing, right? Borrowed money, you took that money and you bought something else, you loaned it out. You borrowed money for one year and you loaned it out for two years. That's what you've done. So today, you actually have zero in terms of your, your assets and liabilities. Okay, now let's see what happens next year. In one year's time, that 9.52 magically turns into 10. Okay? So, but it's a negative 10, meaning you borrowed 9.52. You've got to pay back 9.52 with interest. How much interest? 5%, that's the one year rate. So now you actually have to pay back $10 million. Well, it just so happens you have $10 million. How? From the money that's coming in from your subsidiary, that repatriation amount of money. So you take that $10 million, you pay it back, and you're done with that part of your portfolio. What do you have left? What you have left is a bond that will pay you money in the year after that, between years one and two. And there you go, you get paid $10.9 million. You've done all of this transaction today. You've locked in the rates today. Okay? So, yeah? You're locking in the one year spot rate one year ago? That's right. You're locking, well, you're locking in the forward rate which is the forecast, Expected. right, it's, the, it's, it's what the market expects the future one year spot rate will be. Now, let's a good, that's a good point that you bring up, which is, let's say, let's say that in year one, it turns out that at that point in time, the one year spot rate is 7%. Are you happy or are you sad? Some people say sad, some people say happy. <coughs> What, what do you, if the one year spot rate, one year from now, is 7%, and you've done this deal already, you're happy, that's right. Because, what are you getting on your portfolio? 9%. Now, wait a minute, how do you get 9%? I thought that I told you the two year rate was 7%. I'm, I'm purposely confusing you, so I'm hoping it works, and then I'm going to try to unconfuse you, and I hope that works too. 5% is the one-year spot rate. 7% is the two-year spot rate. Yeah. Right, that's right. The year between, the rate between years one and two is around 9%. And the reason it's got to be that way is the 7% that I told you, that's a two-year rate, right? That's the average of two years. But you know what the rate is the first year? The first year rate is 5%. So if something averages to 7% over two years, but the first year is five, the second year's gotta be greater than seven, otherwise the average can't be seven. 
In fact, the second year rate, the, the, the one year rate between years one and two is around 9%. And so that's why if when you arrive on, at the end of year one, ready to borrow for one more year, and you've already locked in a 9% rate, you are pretty happy that the rate at that time is seven. However, if I told you that the rate at that time was 15, you'd be kicking yourself because you locked in a 9% rate and yet it's 15%, okay? So there's room for regret as well as celebration depending on what market's gonna do. But the point is that in year zero, I don't know what it's gonna be and I'm not, a, I'm not a hedge fund manager, I'm not a trader, I don't care, I don't wanna make a bet on future interest rates, I just wanna get this problem solved. And right now, today, I can actually solve my problem of, of figuring out how to invest my money between years one and two by doing this very simple transaction in open markets with market determined interest rates. And I know as long as the interest rates are not nuts, then I'm getting a reasonable deal. Yeah. And Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but the problem is that you don't know what that one year T bill rate will be. Whereas right now, you know that it's 9%. Right now, you know it's 9%. And it seems like a pretty good deal. Go ahead and do it. If, however, you think that interest rates are going to go up, much more than the market thinks, then you may want to wait. But now you're becoming an interest rate speculator. You're, you're, you're taking risk. And as a CFO, that's generally not your job and not your level of competency, right? You're not there trying to forecast interest rates. Yeah. That's right. The 9.524 is the present value of $10 million today at a rate of 5% interest. Okay? So the way that I did this, and you know, th this is a good illustration of what I've been telling you about finance not being a spectator sport. I suspect that all of you understand the lectures that I've given so far about present value and about time value of money and the fact that you've got to use the right exchange rate. It all is pretty straightforward. But putting it into practice is not so easy. At least for me, I don't find this example so transparent. You have to actually spend some time thinking about it thinking about where the money's coming from, where the money's going, how much money you have at any point in time. And, but when you work it out, it all makes sense. And so I would encourage all of you to spend some time working this out, okay? Uh, question? Yeah, okay. Yes, there, there are ways you can engage in a forward contract, of course, so you don't have to do this. But the fact is doing this is so simple, why not, you know? And if it's simple, most likely it'll be cheap. If it's complex, that's when you're gonna pay for it, right? So I'm happy to structure a derivatives product for you. Let's call it a structured product that we trade over the counter where I offer you a forward contract, one year borrowing with certain terms and privileges and so on. And by the time we're done, I'm gonna charge you a transaction fee of, oh, I don't know, maybe 5% versus you buy a two-year bill and a, a two-year bond and a one-year bill and you're done, right? So that, that's the difference. It's really the ease with which you can implement the strategy. All of you right now, today, all of you can do this. You can do this. You can actually trade in these markets, set up a brokerage account, trade these in treasury instruments, do this yourself. In fact, you can do this online. So it's very, very simple. And yeah. yeah. Oh, well, yeah, that's, that, that's the hard part. Yeah. There's an old Steve Martin joke that says, I'm going to show you how to uh, make a million dollars and pay no taxes. First, get a million dollars. So, yes, that, that's the hard part. Okay. Um, so now this transaction, this transaction today locks you in to a 9% rate between years one and two. And so going back to the question that Anand raised, should you do this or should you just wait? Well, it depends. Do you feel lucky? Do you, do you think, do you think you could do better than 9%? I mean, today, 9% looks wonderful, but that's not what the rate you're gonna get today. In fact, if you go back to the Bloomberg site, you can see what kind of rate you would lock in today between years one and years two. And I promise you, it's nowhere near 9%.
And so again, you might, you might actually say today, in today's low interest rate environment, you might say, look, I think that inflation is going to heat up a great deal over the next year. And therefore, what's implicit in today's forecast of future spot rates is lower than I think it ought to be. So I'm going to hold off. That's a bet. And so you're going to take some risks, that's all. And for those people who are good at taking risks like that, they end up doing well. And for those who don't, they end up you know, losing out on good opportunities. Okay, there's another example that I'd like you to look at and work through on your own. It's very similar to the first one, but it just gives you practice thinking about timelines and moving money back and forth and trying to understand how to structure the payoffs in order to uh, satisfy certain consumption patterns. So if you look at this example and work it through, that'll give you more practice on uh, you know, how to deal with these transactions. Okay? So now, if there are no more questions about pure discount bonds, I want to turn to the more general case of coupon bonds. These are bonds that pay off coupons. And really, the theory behind coupon bonds is virtually identical to that of discount bonds, in the sense that you can always look at a coupon bond as a the package of discount bonds, right? That's sort of the opposite of a strip. A strip takes a coupon bond and breaks it up into what look like little discount bonds. Well, if you think about what a coupon bond is, it's really just a collection of discount bonds at different maturities. That's the way to think about it. So here's a simple example. A three-year bond with a 5% coupon is going to look like this. It's going to pay 50, 50, and then 1,000, 50. Now, as I mentioned, there are some coupon bonds that pay I mean, annually, so when they say that there's a coupon of 3%, it's 3% every six months. So you have to take that into account when you're computing the present values of these objects. How do we do it? Exactly the same way as we do for pure discount bonds. Take the coupons, each of them, and discount them back to the present using either the big R's or the little r's. Either way, you ought to get the same answer because the little r's are simply the uh, geometric averages of the big r's, okay? However, instead of using the little r's for the different uh, payments, coupon bonds are often quoted with a single number that is a yield. So the theoretically correct way to write the price is given up there. P0 is equal to C, all the coupons, divided by the appropriate big R's. Or we could replace every one of those big R's with the appropriate little r. By appropriate little r, I mean little r01, little r02, little r03, right? Each of those. But we can also calculate an average of all of those little r's and just use one variable and to simplify notation I'm going to give it a completely different symbol y and say what is that single number y that will give me the price and that y is known as the particular bonds yield it is the single interest rate which, if interest rates were constant throughout time, would make the present value of all the coupons and principal equal to the current price. Okay, so if you think about a mortgage and you ask the question, if the interest, if the mortgage rate is 5%, is the value of the, uh, of the loan, that's exactly this expression right here, okay? Now, obviously, when you get a, a fixed rate mortgage of 5.89%, you know that the interest rate is not really going to be 5.89% forever. The interest rate changes every year, but that 5.89%
is an average of the 30 year period where you're going to be borrowing that mortgage money. So you can think of this discount, uh, the coupon bond exactly the same way. We quote this number Y as a yield. Sometimes we talk about yield instead of prices. But the way that we figure out the yield is we take this 30 year bond that pays 5% a year, we auction it off and we figure out what the price is. Given the price, we can find the yield. Finding the yield is not so easy in this case because in this case, unlike just taking a simple geometric average, which is what we did to calculate the little r's and the big r's, in this case, in order to find the y, we actually have to solve an equation that can be highly nonlinear. In fact, it's a polynomial. It's a, a teeth order polynomial. And for those of you high school math team jocks, you'll remember that um, when you've got uh, a teeth order polynomial, first of all, you have a lot of solutions. How many solutions do you typically have? T. And of those solutions, how many of them are guaranteed to be real numbers? Right, there's no guarantee that any of them are real. Now, you might ask, well, what do you mean by real? Well, if you're asking me, you don't need to know. <laughs> don't, don't. Uh, it, it means numbers that we encounter in reality. Let's call it that, put it that way. There are, it turns out that there are numbers that actually don't exist in reality. Uh, they're called complex numbers. And uh, they are quite complex, so I won't uh, talk about them. But these kinds of equations, it turns out that they're not guaranteed to even have real solutions. Now, it turns out that for bonds, where the coupon payments are all positive and the principal is all positive, it turns out in that very restrictive, and the price is positive, it turns out in those cases, you actually do get uh, a real number, at least one real number. The problem is that in some cases you get multiple real numbers and then it's very, very hard to figure out which yield is the correct one to use. The only reason I'm telling you about this is because it turns out as a matter of convention, very often people will quote Y, these little Y yields when they talk about coupon bonds. But the way to think about that is to think about the price, which is the present value of the coupon payments, as a present discounted value of the interest that really applies between today and date T. In fact, in order to do this present value calculation, you need not just one interest rate. How many interest rates do you need? T, right? You're at year zero, and you've got payments for every single year between one and T. So you need interest rates that apply between zero and one, zero and two, zero and three, and so on. You need T interest rates or exchange rates, right? Or exchange rates between different dates. But now the yield is important because it allows us to quote the pseudo rate of return of this bond uh, in a single number. And very often, people will plot the Y's as a function of the horizon of these bonds. So when I showed you that yield curve, let me get, it, get that back. Whoops, I just had it. Alt. Let's take a look at this again. These uh, treasury bonds from years two to years 30, those have coupon payments. And those are the coupon rates. And they have prices and they have yields. So what's plotted here is not the little r, it's the y for the coupon bonds. And so, the reason that they're not the same is because the yields, the little y's, they depend on the coupon payments. Uh, and, and really, strictly speaking, we don't care about coupon payments when we look at time to maturity. We just want to know what is the interest rate between 0 and 1, 0 and 2, 0 and 3, 0 and 5, and so on. But this is a reasonable proxy as long as the coupons don't look too crazy and are not too different from each other. And you can see that the coupons are all sort of in the same neighborhood. You know, some of them are 2.3% versus 4.5%, but they're not so different. So this gives us uh, an indication of what the, the strips yield curve would look like. All right? 
So, let me uh, go back. Here's an example of the historical yield curve for Treasury securities. And let me just show you a plot. They move around a lot. So these yield curves tell us something about the average interest rate across various different maturities. So if you look at the, um, the yellow line, that's a one-year yield curve, or sorry, one-year yield uh, over time. So this is not the yield curve anymore. This is a plot of the time series of one-year yields 